Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, it is, I am uh, Professor Matty Simiotiki, Interim Director of the School of Cities at the University of Toronto. Uh, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to our third seminar series in the Global Urban Network uh, Seminar. Um, today, we are gonna be speaking about pandemic responses and beyond, uh, which is a really important and timely topic. Uh, to moderate today's session, I'm pleased to uh, turn it over to my colleague, uh, Professor Shauna Braille. Uh, Shauna is uh, Associate Professor uh, in the Institute for Management and Innovation at the University of Toronto, Mississauga. Shauna, over to you. Thank you very much, Maddie, and thank you to the School of Cities for convening both the Global Urban Network and today's conversation, which is part of a series um, that at the core focus on collaboration, common ground, and learning. Um, I think every time we get together on Zoom, it's uh, a time that we need to acknowledge the absolutely devastating impacts on both cities, and even more importantly, on people and their lives uh, as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic and its various uh, variants, which have um, really created just uh, massive turmoil and disruption around the world uh, and very significant death and devastation. I recall Maddie at the outset of the pandemic last March in Toronto, when we first started to shut down, that you and I had a conversation about, you know, what we could do as urbanists, as geographers, uh, to, to, you know, anything that we could do that would relate to understanding what could be done about this sort of this, the COVID-19 and what we could do um, when so much of the focus was really on public health and public health experts. And <laughs> excuse me, over the course of the year, it's become more than obvious that there are ways that we can contribute in terms of building collaborations to share knowledge and ideas in terms of examining um, the impacts, but also understanding new outputs and in terms of influencing policy and policy shifts and changes in thinking that actually can hopefully, ideally, uh, bring us to a better place from where we are now, which is, which is a place of real sort of fear and devastation and a time of uh, really just terrific uh, uncertainty and anxiety. So I am um, pleased in a sense to be able to be here today with our colleagues uh, from the US, the UK, India, all of the uh, other guests participating in the webinar. Um, and um, just uh, before I introduce them, um, I'll just let you know that at the that we'll feature three presentations from our speakers, each up to about 10 minutes in length. Um, the rest of the time will be reserved for questions. You can ask questions at any time using the chat function. Um, the event will be recorded and there is a note um, with that information as well on the chat. Um, when you ask a question, please include your name and your affiliation along with your question. If you wanna ask a question during the live Q&A towards the end, you can raise your hand and I'm gonna do my best to find it. Um, but you can also put that in the chat in the text. And if you wish to enable or disable the closed captioning feature, click on the CC button at the, should be at the bottom uh, of your screen. It's there now. Um, and um, captions are in English only. If you are posting about today's event on Twitter or LinkedIn, please use the hashtag urban2021. So it is now my pleasure to introduce our three speakers. I'll introduce them. Uh, all at the beginning and then they will in turn give their presentations. Our first speaker is Professor Eugenie Birch. She is the co-director of the Penn Institute for Urban Research at the University of Pennsylvania uh, and also the Lawrence C. Nister Chair of Urban Research and Education at the University of Pennsylvania. She is also the president of the General Assembly of Partners, which is the engagement platform for the implementation of the UN's new urban agenda. And Professor Birch's current research and teaching focuses on global urbanization. 
Our second speaker will be Professor Simon Marvin. Simon is the director of the Urban Institute at the University of Sheffield. His work examines the interrelationships between socio-technical change and the urban condition. And in his remarks, he will reflect critically on the ways in which urban technologies have been repurposed to manage COVID and the wider issues raised by such forms of experimentation. And then finally, Professor Pradipta Banerjee, who is a professor in the Department of Civil Engineering at IIT Bombay, uh, where uh, he has been awarded the Excellence in Teaching Award and was the Dean of Alumni and International Relations for two years. Professor Banerjee is going to focus his remarks on a pandemic case study of the Mumbai metropolitan region and share some analysis in light of the most recent um, and current second wave of infection in India. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Eugenie. Um, if you would like to share your screen, um, you should be able to, and if not, then you can just go ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for this very gracious introduction and uh, for assembling this uh, series of seminars. I think it's very useful for scholars around the world to be, have some thinking about what's happening here. Uh, today, I would like to speak about uh, multilateral institutions and whether or not they include cities in their considerations. Um, as we know that the COVID-19 pandemic led governments at all levels into intense fiscal stress and reports of um, significant drops in their respective economies, international organizations, including the G20, the IMF, the UN, the World Bank, have responded with aggressive moves to support national economies. And within two weeks of uh, WHO's uh, declaration of COVID-19 as a global pandemic, national governments and international organizations devised massive recovery programs. For example, the G20 rallied an extraordinary leaders meeting on March 24th to issue an action plan uh, that in broad strokes pledged to pour more than $5 trillion into the global economy. And the G20 leaders asked the G20 finance ministers working with health ministers to update the plan with new commitments over time. And by the time the leaders met in the following November, they had received two progress reports on the plan and additional initiatives to soften the pandemic's health, economic and social effects. And so too with the um, multilateral development banks led by the World Bank offered more than 200 billion in loans and the IMF both postponed interest payments on outstanding loans and provided some debt forgiveness to the poorest countries. While far from perfect, the institutions tasked with the global economic governance responded quickly and boldly to this challenge. However, one critical piece of response of the pandemic was missing. The key institutions of global economic governance paid scant, if any, attention to the economic plight facing cities. Neither the G20's action plan nor the declaration mentioned local impacts, economies, or recovery efforts. And as, February 20, as of February 2021, only 14% of the funding provided by the G20 plus 10 other major economies has focused directly on cities. And that despite the fact that cities have been especially hard hit by the COVID-19 and are critical to global economic recovery and future growth. After all, 90% of global COVID-19 cases have been in cities. And as producers of 80% of the world GDP, cities have been devastated um, by the almost 4% um, decline in GDP in 2020. And many cities, as you know, are facing a scissor effect, averaging a 15 to 25 percent loss in tax revenues uh, due to and, and being forced to spend significantly more on uh, health and social services. And so the question is, why is this the situation and, and what might we be thinking about to improve this in terms of the multilateral um, institutions that are organized around the world? So what I wanted to do is to uh, particularly look at the uh, work of the G20 uh, in, in this particular effort because of, of, of the strong representation of, uh, of, of, of financial support uh, around the world. And um, we should start, of course, with, um, with an understanding of how these institutions were created. And they were created as, you know, after World War II, uh, they were created for members, nation states to provide stability, economic stability, as well as address conflict and assure that we wouldn't have more world wars over time. And thus they are instruments of nations and nations don't necessarily 
uh, want to include cities in their deliberations as they think about how they're going to distribute their resources. And so we know that cities in the international arena have become uh, part of the scene starting in the 1970s with the Habitat conferences and following up through uh, the one in 2016. Um, we know that uh, institutions like the World Bank have within them divisions that uh, have global practices focused on urban activities. Uh, and particularly, uh, they worked on trying to make cities more credit worthy. They've worked on resilience programs and so forth. But when it comes time to issue their loans and grants, uh, a national sovereign guarantee is necessary. That is, cities can't directly borrow from these institutions, nor within the UN deliberations can cities or mayors have any uh, direct uh, uh, influence on policies other than uh, being able to testify, but they are not a, a voice at the table. Uh, however, we know that the problems that the pandemic has um, uh, uncovered are, are problems that really have a local influence. Um, so uh, what, where have cities been on all of this uh, situation? Cities have created networks over time, starting at the beginning of the 20th century, and these networks have become uh, exceedingly more capable in expressing the, the needs and desires of their, their memberships. For example, UCLG has uh, 240,000 members in 140 nations. It represents 5 billion people or 70% of the global population. And so they've been extremely active in working on things and, and along with C40, uh, which is a network that brings together almost 97, almost 100 of the world's largest cities that uh, tend to have really charismatic mayors and are very good at uh, contributing to the dialogue across across these um, issues. And um, more recently, mayors in cities around the world have engaged in diplomacy, direct diplomacy through their own offices of mayor's uh, office of uh, international affairs, which are largely concerned with trade and uh, economic development, and of course, are uh, limited by what they can do by their national constitutions. But nonetheless, they too have become very active. And so Let's take a look at the G20 and it, how it works with um, stakeholders. The G20 has eight engagement groups, uh, ranging from business to um, labor to youth, and more recently, the U20 that was created in uh, three years ago in Buenos Aires. And the U20 and each one of these engagement groups um, works on a communique, which it provides and works with the leaders in an effort to uh, influence what might um, come out in the leaders' declaration, which sets global policy for, uh, in, in particular, uh, the, the concern that we have today, which is the, the COVID-19 activity. So um, last year, um, at the beginning of the engagement process for the U20, the conveners and the host city, which was Riyadh, had arranged a very elaborate and exciting uh, portfolio of studies that were to be done uh, to support their communique. Uh, however, mid-course during that work, COVID struck, and they created a special working group on, on the, um, on the um, uh, COVID. And this special working group produced a report. The outcome of this was basically a call for a city-organized and city-run fund uh, to support responses to COVID immediately and, to, and future shocks. Um, this made its way into the summit of the uh, U20. It was announced and supported by the host city and thoughts were beginning to, uh, and they're continuing to uh, work around this particular topic and will be worked on uh, for the uh, uh, upcoming meeting that will happen in June of this year of the uh, U20. Um, at any rate, but let's take a look at the communiques of the leader's uh, declaration. This was uh, issued in November, 2020, and it was faithful basically to the G20 mandate to promote global economic growth, international trade, and the efficient regulation of financial markets. And in light of the COVID-1920, the four-part four declaration really did focus on recovery issues. But when we 
examine this, the only thing that made its way into that leaders uh, summit uh, declaration was basically um, a support for the circular economy. Everything else that the various other uh, U20 uh, suggestions uh, did not make its way into that uh, particular communique, which is devastating when you think about it, because unless you have the support of national leaders and finance ministers, you're not going to get the kind of um, resources that need to be devoted directly to cities. Uh, so um, in a paper that I'm writing with uh, William Burke White at Penn, we've come up with some suggestions for how this might be addressed. And basically, um, we need to think about, we come up with four suggestions uh, that basically um, the multilateral institutions need to engage in a broader array of stakeholders in a, in a meaningful way, it's subnational governments. Um, they need to recognize that um, cities are not just another NGO group advocating for an issue, but they basically are governance units that have a legitimate role to be part of these discussions in a more powerful way. And secondly, the city-based diplomacy ne networks need to align themselves more closely with what's happening at these global levels, not just talk about their own interests, but see how they fit into the into the global uh, agendas that are uh, working. And uh, uh, we have uh, detailed how this might happen. I'm going to be running out of my 10 minutes town. I just want to put this on the table that we need to be thinking um, as urbanists as to how to align more successfully with the international organizations that are basically run by nations and finding ways to make nations think of cities as more than just other NGOs. Thank you very much. Eugenie, thank you very much. And thank you for uh, self uh, managing the 10 minute time slot so perfectly. I am going to ask you when we come to the Q&A uh, to talk a little bit more about the scissor effect um, as well as the institutional component. And I'd now like to turn it over uh, to Simon for his remarks. Yes, uh, th thanks very much for the invitation and to the organizers. I think it's really important at this time as academics, we have these opportunities to, to reflect across the different contexts that, within which we work about what's important to us. So. Um, I'm, I'm going to just speak for, for 10 minutes and, and, and try to do that as succinctly and expertly as you, Eugenie did. In terms of, I'm an urban technologist and I'm really intrigued about the interconnection between urban infrastructures, socio-technical systems, and how, how has COVID um, shaped the way in which those systems have been repurposed? And what might that tell us about uh, the future of the interrelationship between the urban technical um, and the urban condition. Um, what does it, what's disrupted, what's accelerated, and what, what are the sorts of questions we need to be thinking about? And in doing this, I want to make um, a series of pro propositions. Um, the and the first one is the multiplicity of visions of how COVID has reshaped the city is quite mind boggling. And uh, I think it, it, it we've, We've held together images of the death of the city, the rebirth of the city, and the possibility of the re reconfiguration of the urban. And I think these crises are particularly fertile times for thinking through uh, why does the urban matter and what are the possibilities for shaping socio-technical change. Now, that happens in every crisis, global economic crisis, the energy crisis in the 70s, but it takes a long time to work out what's going to happen. And I still don't think it's clear what the long-term implications of COVID are. But we can, if we think carefully about what already exists, we have some pointers to the sorts of questions we should think about. And I think probably like many of you, I got really intrigued in trying to understand how urban studies have dealt with infectious disease historically. And there's a fantastic history of the way in which urban infrastructure, urban planning, health, the whole sort of... Uh, apparatus of uh, social uh, security was developed partially and largely in response to infectious disease. And how actually for those scholars in public health epidemiology who specialize in infectious disease, COVID is not unanticipated. It was recognized this would happen every nine to 11 years. And there's some really good work um, on pre prior infectious diseases. Um, uh, Harris Ali and Roger Kyle's work on SARS and uh, they did a nice piece in urban studies that shows the really intimate 
interconnections between um, urban flows, peri-urban areas, uh, the, inter the international and international connectivity of the urban system. And the way that is mediated through urban infrastructures and technological systems as being absolutely central to understanding the circulation of COVID. So in some senses, we, we already actually uh, have, a, have an understanding of the way in which an infectious disease gets caught up in all sorts of other cir circles and cycles of circulation of people, goods, services, uh, and, 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 and the virus itself. Um, so actually, and we knew that infrastructure was a key conduit to the develop to the movement of these systems and forms of preemption, um, form, form, forms of trying to anticipate worst case scenarios were meant to equip us with a, a, a prepared logic to be able to deal with infectious disease. And it's, uh, it's, it's with some irony, the two nation states who were supposed to be most well prepared, the US and the UK, have struggled to contain the circulation of COVID. But I'm interested in what happens to the urban technical when it interconnects with um, COVID. And I've been struggling to try to understand what, what's happened, what happens? What sorts, of, what sorts of ways does the urban technical get re, reworked? And one, of, I found um, work done by Steve Hinchcliffe, another, another uh, scholar who he writes with on Pathological is a book, very good book, Pathological Lies. It was quite helpful in trying to think through some elements of the interrelationship between COVID and the and, and, and urban infrastructure systems. And they introduce in this book, in the, that book, the concept of biosecurity, which is the raft of measures that states, uh, state agencies, uh, the private sector introduce to, to try to reduce or minimize or prevent the outbreaks of infectious diseases, the spread of uh, bioterror or the threat of bioterrorism, food security issues, through measures aimed at preventing the introduction or spread of harmful organisms. I found this quite an interesting way of trying to think about the urban technical because there seem to be, I think you can make an argument that the urban technical is being reinterwoven with forms of biosecurity. So there's this notion of pandemic tech, cov tech. Um, and what this tends to do is prioritize the security, the biological security and flows of interaction in everyday life. It tries to substitute the face-to-face -face contacts. It tries to ensure those flows, um, not necessarily they're, they're good or bad, but also just filter them according to the level of risk. So it's about how do you enable movement and interaction, but do so with a level of assurance that it's safe to do that. And I think this has spawned this huge uh, uh, landscape of experimentation uh, that Rob Kitching calls technological solutionism. And it's partly about smart cities, it's partly about control rooms, platforms, apps, which have been repurposed around these sort of COVID related applications. But it's also more than that. It's also been about urban robotics and automation, the use of drones and delivery robots and AVs and claims around the use of uh, artificial intelligence and autonomous systems for AI, facial recognition, health diagnostic. It's been a veritable explosion of forms of demonstration, test bed and applications. And more work is now coming out, trying to map and understand, partly map this emerging landscape and slowly try to understand, well, which of these sorts of applications might be, are they temporary? Are they fleeting? or which ones might become more configurational and embedded in the urban context. And there's a couple of, and, and, and what I think is really interesting, this is no longer just about the smart city. This is also about questions of kinetics, mobility, and the physical capacity of uh, automated and autonomous movement um, in a whole series of quite, quite different domains. Now, proposition four, uh, a health warning about the, the, the prognoses of urban transformation that have been related to these sorts of technological experiments. I think we need to be really cautious. So there's a huge amount of continuity in the repurposing of existing technological experiments around COVID in a, in a, in a quite opportunistic, but also I think potentially innovative way. 
There's a tendency in looking at these responses to underplay the importance of social context and governmental capacity. There's a celebration of the role and the preeminent role of technological systems as a form of decision making and intervention, which I think radically overplays the transformative potential. And as we'll see, some of these systems have been really significant in making some populations uh, invisible uh, and outside the remit of state and other forms of intervention. And there's a huge degree of obduracy in the level of change that can take place in these infrastructures. And critically, performativity has been quite, I think, important in trying to demonstrate the way in which the state can intervene in, in, in COVID through these technological systems. And there's some really good work coming out now around this. Um, there's a nice paper uh, in Urban Geography by Anadata and some colleagues that looks at the repurposing of integrated control rooms that are utilized for security and transportation networks um, in many Indian smart cities. And that works really very interesting for showing how um, the mapping of infection rates was actually very, very difficult to do that in a universal manner because of um, the, the population who didn't have access to smartphone systems and the way in which the utilization of control rooms, rather than creating a panopticon, actually made large numbers, particularly of migrant uh, workers, invisible in the, uh, in, in the early stages of the um, response um, to COVID. So these technological systems become quite insignificant as, as passage points and ways of seeing. The other example where work's being done, some of which we've contributed to with colleagues in China, is looking at the repurposing of the sort of safe, smart city initiatives, uh, the bricolage of, of socio-technical systems around the safe, smart cities initiative in China. And this has been often represented as being a ubiquitous um, system of control. And it actually has much more, been much more problematic um, and it's some of the work we've done with colleagues in China, you know, the, 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 the app didn't work between different, different cities. Some of, the drone, some of the delivery systems were done, undertaken on very straight uh, pre-planned routes and were, only had a relatively marginal role in the nature of the response. And there was all sorts of problems with the AI facial recognition and the biothermal monitoring of populations. But you can see the way in which there's this attempt to reconstitute existing technological affordances and repurpose them uh, in order to try to address this question of how to ensure um, the, the, the ability to maintain flows, but to do so with a claim of safety. Now I think, what, this, what, what does this mean for how we need to think about the future of urban technologies? And this is my last slide. So I think actually living with COVID, and thinking through the way in which urban technicity and the urban technical have become repurposed and, uh, and this intensity of, of experimentation, leave us with sort of three, I think, quite intriguing uh, questions and possibilities that we need to think through. And I think, will, will the visions of, so these fourth industrial city imaginaries of the use of robotics and drones, these post-smart initiatives that take digital technologies and rework them with autonomous capacities that can work with humans or substitute humans. What happens when those sorts of technological imaginaries are linked with ways of living with COVID? So how is the biosecure city imagined? Is it a collective vision of uh, communal security? Or is it really about how you have more individuated or, or enclaves of security? I think the second question is around the operationalization of these systems. Which of them start to gain traction and become configurational? Which networks and spaces are reconfigured through these forms of biosurveillance, disinfection, uh, distancing, and these secures, the secured environments in which there is potentially forms of substitution? And um, how, do, how, do they, so how do they interrelate with the existing socio-spatial structure of the city? And the third and final question is, these systems have been much more glitchy and uh, difficult to um, uh, maintain and experiment with in a configurational way. So how effective and efficient are the methods and techniques and the claims that are made about them? And, and does this create a sort of archipelago of, 
of so-called biosecure enclaves? Is it possible using techno-mediated systems to try to uh, enhance uh, your, your, your individual or the security at the level of enclaves and, um, and distance yourself from threatening environments? And what are the social and material limits of the ability to try to transcend the commons uh, and the way in which this virus is able to move uh, in really quite surprising ways, not just through, in, through, in, through infrastructures, materials and social relationships. And on that, I'll leave, uh, I'll come to an end. Thank you. Simon, thank you very much for touching on the, the sort of really tremendous shift towards you know, both incremental and disruptive innovation during uh, COVID, the issues around equity and solutionism and, and surveillance, and yet at the same time, a great reliance on so many of, on so many of these technologies to manage us safely through this period. So more, more food for thought for our uh, Q&A that's coming shortly. But first uh, to Pradipta Banerjee uh, in Mumbai. Pradipta, um, the floor is yours. You're on mute. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll just share my screen. Uh, good evening, everybody from India. Uh, I'd like to look at, uh, you know, uh, one of the issues I think. Uh, uh, Simon did talk about some of the uh, aspects of smart cities uh, initiatives that have happened in India. Uh, one of the major aspects of difference between what I'm going to be talking about and, and what the smart cities uh, in India, mostly the smart cities which are there in India, uh, the difference between Mumbai uh, and the smart cities is essentially in density. And uh, in, in this, uh, you know, this is, the COVID is just one kind of, uh, you know, it's a pandemic, uh, but, you know, uh, we've had uh, in India, especially in Mumbai, a series of other infectious diseases that happen. Uh, of course, here, this is, this is actually had an effect that's a, a order of magnitude higher than any of the other ones. Uh, and one of the issues that in Mumbai and, and cities which are, uh, are uh, where uh, land is becoming scarce and very expensive, uh, you know, uh, is uh, enabling densities, okay? And, and the questioning uh, of the compactness of the cities with respect to the pandemic uh, issues, this is what I want to do. I just wanted to acknowledge that, uh, you know, this work, uh, is being done by my doctoral student, Anirudh Paul, and I'm just, uh, you know, going along for the ride. Uh, so uh, I just want to do one thing. Uh, one of the things that I wanted to talk about, uh, you know, this presentation, I kind of uh, didn't have too much time uh, to, to put it together. Uh, what I've done actually is we've looked at, uh, you know, the, the uh, Mumbai metropolitan area, has 30 million people living in about 120 square mile, uh, square kilometer area. Uh, so now, you know, uh, we're talking about nations uh, living in, in a small area. Uh, so the densities that we are talking about are, are, are not really, uh, does not exist anywhere else in the world, even in China, uh, because, uh, because uh, what's happening is uh, Mumbai is an island and it's uh, you know, constrained uh, by water on all sides. And that's one of the reasons why the compactness has an issue. And what we did was, because we couldn't study the entire uh, city, uh, you know, the, I just wanted to make one particular point uh, that uh, Eugenie mentioned uh, was about the fact that mayors, uh, you know, Indian cities are slightly different from uh, cities all over the world in that uh, the city is not really uh, run by the mayor. Uh, uh, the mayor is an elected official 
uh, with no real, uh, you know, they're more advisors as such. And, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the entire process is handled by uh, the bureaucracy. Uh, and of course, the bureaucracy involves uh, public health, engineers, all, all and, and administrators and all of that. Uh, and the, uh, the Mumbai, of course, is one of the richest cities in India. There's no doubt about that. Uh, but I just wanted to mention one of the things before I go ahead. I've looked at three typical wards. The city is, is broken up into about uh, 32 wards, wards being smaller areas uh, where similar kind of geography can be looked at. Uh, so we've picked up three wards. Uh, one is a, a, a kind of a, a where economic activity happens and therefore uh, this is the older kind of uh, uh, you know ward where densities are not that large then we have another uh, ward which happens to be uh, uh, outside south america in fact at one time the world's largest uh, uh, you know slum uh, pocket uh, that's uh, dharavi and the third award that we're looking at is what is the current uh, kind of thing that's going on in, in, in Mumbai, which is, uh, you know, densification by verticalization. Uh, and, and so we're looking at three different kind of things. To really look at it, uh, this is, I hope all of you can see uh, my presentation. Uh, if you look at this, this is, this is Mumbai. It's the island city of Mumbai. It's got water on all sides, uh, and and uh, the the, uh, the the parts that we've looked at is this this ward, the sea ward. Uh, you know, if you look at it, uh, the sea ward is actually a uh, 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 the old part uh, of Mumbai. This existed this existed for well over uh, three centuries. This part. Uh, then we look at uh, this ward, this ward here, the GN ward, which is the largest slum uh, in uh, in Asia for sure and the world at one time. And here in the northern part, uh, by the way, this ward also is about 100 years old. This is about 300 years old. It's about 100 years old. This is only about 40 years old, 40 to 50 years old. Uh, this is the this is the new part uh, of town. So we're looking at three wards: one which is extremely old, one which is about hundred odd years old, and one which is relatively new. And 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 what we see is we'll we'll soon see that uh, this area, this the densification that we are really looking at here, are are looking at about uh, all over. Uh, uh, this thing we're looking at about 230, uh, you know, people per hectare, and and uh, you know, Paris, which is a global. So if you look at it, uh, you know, this kind of over over the entire island city, we're really looking at really really large. You know, despite the fact that you know you've got very large cities like Shanghai and Hong Kong, and and London uh, with large populations. But essentially what you have is, this I'm talking about the island city has about 12.5 million people, but that's 230, that's a fairly large. And then you've got these kind of areas where you're talking about 3,000 to 5,000 people per hectare. Okay, so that's the kind of, uh, you know, this thing. And, and the pandemic we know uh, is that wherever there is, there is a large proximity, uh, that's where the effect is the largest. Uh, so uh, I'm sorry. This, uh, yeah, I think I this was a different. Uh, thing. So we look at this. Uh, this is the old, 300-year-old uh, 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 kind of this thing. It's essentially, uh, you know, characterized by wadis. Wadis are essentially areas where there is, uh, you know, people, the people living, and and. Typically, wadis are, you've got these kind of buildings with some open area in between. And in the buildings, the, the kind of uh, uh, this thing, uh, 
uh, uh, the the population is very large but then this part is also used as part of the so social structure uh, so social social uh, society is very different over here and of course you have bazaars uh, so you are basically if you look at it uh, these are the areas which are residential in region these are uh, you know uh, the 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 bazaars uh, the, these areas are the bazaars which are on the periphery uh, and uh, you've got the schemes the schemes are what are known as the new kind of densification uh, kind of this thing uh, so and, and these are these are uh, this is this is actually this is the uh, the, the uh, you know the what is known as the queen's necklace the marine drive this is the marine drive with the uh, sea on this side and so these are the institutional areas with very very low um, uh, you know kind of uh, uh, what should i say densities so the major densities are actually in these kind of wadi areas okay uh, then if we look at uh, at dharavi dharavi is about 100 odd years old here what you have is and you're looking at here you're looking at population densities of 3500 per hectare 3100 uh, you know these are the kind of densities that you're looking about uh, so now I'll just I'll just state a, uh, some of the things. Uh, in the first wave, in the first wave, uh, this this uh, this ward was not affected significantly. For the simple reason is that uh, you know all of these, which are the bazaars, were all shut down. They were all completely shut down, and and so this area being fairly insular, in the sense that very few people go into these areas and they're almost populated by people who live in this area. So here, the, the numbers were fairly small. Uh, Dharavi in the first wave was absolutely chaotic. Absolutely chaotic. Because by the way, just wanted to mention that this is also the economic hub where a lot of people from outside come in on a regular basis. So uh, here, the infection rates in the first wave was absolutely catastrophic. There were these horror stories of, of, of COVID patients and dead people lying next to each other in the hospital in this area. <clears throat> okay. so these are the kind of typical kind of, this is the Dharavi Chal, okay? You've got this, this, this is one lot. You can see like literally, there's no space. They're just living on top of each other with, with absolute gunk flowing through. This is another kind of view. And this is the third view. This is the view that I was talking about. These are the uh, you know kind of uh, development schemes which are vertical in nature. And then you've got these kind of areas being used for, for uh, you know, economic activity, etc. Now we look at what is known as the newer one, which is about 50 years old. Here, this is this is this is the typical. Here also you have uh, shanties, but you've also got these huge towers. Uh, you know, you've got these uh, old schemes with new towers, and these are absolutely new. Now, having shown you the kind of situation that there is, this is what uh, happened. If you look at it. Uh, you know, in the first phase, as I said, these were not that affected, okay? Uh, and it was Dharavi, this was the one that was affected uh, significantly, GN. This is Dharavi. Now, what's happened is that Dharavi very, very quickly, and this is something that I want to mention, I just want to show you the, this thing. Actually, you know, everybody talks about the first wave and second wave. There actually has been no wave. It's actually been go going up constantly, and now it's going up exponentially. I mean, the numbers are now beyond, uh, you know, uh, this thing. Uh, we just wanted to, I just wanted to come to uh, uh, this thing. And that is that in the second wave, and this is where I want to kind of, uh, you know, bring it down. In the second wave, Dharavi has had no effects at all. You know, very little. And whereas uh, the, the PN ward, uh, which is the vertical 
towers uh, and the A ward, which is also the richest part. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, if you look at the A ward, uh, it probably is the richest uh, real estate in the world. Okay, uh, even richer than than uh, parts of London and New York. Uh, that's the part. Now, these are the parts which were not affected the first wave. They're affected and as well as the vertical towers. Whereas Dharavi, and this is where I want, to, I want to make my postulation. Because you see, what happens is when you've got 12.5 million, million people, okay, and you've got a municipal corporation uh, which is fairly central in nature, it's impossible. They've been trying to do uh, testing, and that's why the numbers are going up. But other than that, they really don't do too much. But let's see what ha why Dharavi has not had the second wave. And that is, this is where involving communities, this is where the Dharavi, the slum, they have historically been very community driven. Okay. The uh, community volunteer in Rafinaga reached out to several NGOs and the NGOs started doing all kinds of uh, activities, food shortages, you know, the, 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 the local kind of, uh, you know, part, uh, kind of uh, stores, they started uh, helping out. So the, what happened is that there was a significant effect of local and community kind of uh, uh, reaction. Uh, and, and, and that has continued and which is why in the second wave, this has not been affected significantly. In fact, this is one of the places where there's very few uh, uh, this thing. So if you really look at it, this is, this is what I'm saying. This is, this is the kind of different kinds of uh, areas in Dharavi and almost all of them have <clears throat> affected in, in this way. And, and if we look at it, what's happened is, and this is the funny part, Look at the resilience, and this is, you know, if we really want to look at the way forward, we need to look at resilience to pandemic. Pa I mean, no, forget pandemic, epidemic. You know, if you look at it at a local level, epidemics are going to keep happening, you know, in India uh, uh, all the time, especially in Mumbai. It is a resilience that is very, very important. And that's one of the things that we want, we've actually been trying to look at. Uh, you know, uh, if you look at it, this is a resilience spectrum. Type 1 resilience is characterized by resistance to change. Type 2 is where marginal changes are made in order to make a system. And type 3 is where there's a high degree of openness, adaptability, and flexibility. And what I wanted to make today is the fact that Dharavi as a space has a high degree of openness and adaptability. And that is one of the reasons why it has not been affected significantly in the second wave. Whereas if you look at the new, new wards, you know, because they're fairly new, they're extremely resistant, resistant to change. Okay. And that is one of the reasons why we feel that they're resistant to change. There's not too much of openness and community feeling and societal interaction and, 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 uh, you know, that's one of the reasons why the entire second wave is supposed to be in high rises. Uh, there are 1260 high rises that have been our containment zones in, in Mumbai. And those are the containment zones. So those are the only containment zones in the second wave. And so therefore, the issue that we find is that uh, essentially, uh, you know, again, PN Ward is on the north side. Almost all the activity happens on the south side. So they travel by trains, uh, you know, whereas Dharavi is very, very, you know, self contained, uh, you know, and again, uh, the, the, the E Ward is also fairly self contained and more people coming in from outside. So one of the things that we found, and this is, this is seen, is that. Uh, you know, although the technology does have an effect, but in the kind of densities that we see, the social aspects, 
cannot be gainsaid. And, and what we see is that most of the second wave, we see that any place that has, has a high degree of openness and adaptability, and Dharavi is an example of that, has actually been able to you know, live uh, better. And and that's, that's them, so, uh, are you wrapping up? Yeah, I'm done. I just wanted oh. to, I just wanted to <laughs> say that uh, I wanted to kind of counterpoint Simon's technology by saying that uh, you know community uh, uh, seems to have a more effect in an Indian context because in Indian context technology is still not at that. Pradipta, thank you very much. I'm sorry to have interrupted you at the end. Thank you very much. Um, you, your, your remarks really touched on the one of the you know the big questions around density and development and the challenge of density um, with respect to the pandemic and what does that mean for the future of cities as dense concentrations of people and also obviously highlighted the role of community and the role that community organizing plays in in building. Uh, resilience in cities in that crucial role, which means that across the three presentations, we talked about the role of governments and institutions, of, of civic actors and communities, of entrepreneurs and industry, um, I'll add, and the role of, of scholars, um, and really sort of sends a message that there is a role for multiple actors, obviously, to play in this very complex challenge. We have a couple of questions in the chat. Um, which um, I would like to ask. And if there are others who have questions, please feel free to put those in the chat. I'll also say if we don't have time to answer all of the questions live on the panel, there will be an opportunity to respond to them after. So please uh, feel free to add your questions. Um, a couple of questions focus on the role of density and densification. Um, and and Pradeep, especially from your perspective, uh, but also from the perspective of Eugenie and Simon, what, what does the pandemic mean for the future of density in, in cities? Do we need to think about a different urban form or do we need to think about different ways of managing? Pradipta? Uh, uh, I, yeah, uh, in, in my mind, I think, you know, it's very difficult given given the paucity of land in the island city, uh, I mean, I'm talking about Mumbai specifically, you know, if, 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 if cities can grow laterally, okay, uh, then maybe densification, reducing densification is one way of, of, of uh, being resilient to the pandemic. But then, you know, you've got the reverse thing of Delhi, uh, which doesn't have very much of density, but a lot of movement, because you see what happens is, see, uh, this is where the issue becomes, is that just densification by itself, uh, you know, should I say reducing dens density by itself is not good enough if, uh, if economic activity itself does not flow out. You know, uh, what happens is if economic activity is in a particular part in the center of the city and everybody moves inwards and outwards, uh, you know, there's this there's, there's movement in to and fro that actually in the pandemic has been shown to be a very bad situation. Whereas in, in, in density uh, kind of situation, uh, you know, let, let me put it this way. The containment uh, has been easier uh, because, you know, it's, it, it's, it's you can kind of uh, look at it that you, you can uh, kind of contain it in one zone, uh, you know. Uh, uh, that's that's of course containment. That is institutional containment. Okay. The other aspect that I keep saying is that if the community at large keeps interacting and kind of helping each other, I think that's also something. So identification is not something that we can do away with, especially in cities like Mumbai and Hong Kong and such places. You know, they are going to be dense. And it's how we manage uh, that aspect is, is, I think, key. Thank you. Eugenie, do you have comments on the density piece of this? Sure. Um, I think you have to think about density in different, 
in, in context. Uh, certainly what we were seeing with Professor Banerjee is, is very different from what you might see in uh, a more emerged economy. And I think also you need to think about way, the way, different ways density can be designed. Um, there are wonderful images. I was quickly trying to search my, my uh, resources here for a, a wonderful image. I have of three different types of densities, one with the yeah, tower, yeah. Car, <laughs> one with uh, more, more low density, low uh, lying buildings with uh, all on the same site and at the same density, but different ways of designing it, which yeah, allow yeah, for yeah. Uh, more healthy um, living within yeah. dense places. So um, you, we, and so, so, so we can design density to work uh, in a way that's supportive of public health, number one. And number two, we can't confuse density with overcrowding. Um, overcrowding is something to be dealt with. Uh, density is, is, can be dealt with differently. Thank you. Simon, I wonder if you want to weigh in here or if you want to touch on this, which is not exactly a debate, but the discussion between the role of community versus the role of, of technology and, and what is it that builds with this kinds of resilience to respond. Yeah, I, I, um, along, alongside the sort of highly technicized approaches, a um, number of nation states have been sponsoring the use of, like, the use of apps, um, platforms, and uh, try, try, trying to facilitate, I mean, in Singapore, and there's lots of examples in India and elsewhere as well, to try to stimulate um, the, the, the use of, of ICTs as, as, a, as, a, as an adjunct, as a, as a support for community involvement. Um, but I, I think it's, it's the pre-existing so, social institutional arrangements that are really critical for enabling those sorts of um, local, um, quite dynamic, uh, responses and clearly they've been really important in a, a whole a whole series of contexts as well. And some something something of an antidote to the um, the claim the claims about the transformative potential of of, 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 of control rooms and large scale apps as well. Thank you. I'm aware it's uh, it's just on 11 and um, we haven't had a, a lot of time for, for discussion. I think we could go a lot longer, um, but this is this is only the big, this is still the beginning and not the end. And so I'm hopeful that we'll continue to have these conversations um, both at this sort of global scale across our institutions uh, and individually, there's obviously much more to be to be said and to be done. I want to thank our uh, three speakers, Predictive Banerjee, um, Simon Marvin, and Eugenie Birch for joining us today, and also to the School of Cities for organizing. Uh, thank you very much. Have a good morning, evening, afternoon, or evening, wherever wherever you are. Thank you.